following our meeting, we will go back to executive session to continue our personnel discussion and also uh, a brief board workshop follow-up session. I'll talk more about that in my president's report. So if you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence. Okay, item 3.01, superintendent's report, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have a whole lot this evening. I just have a few items. I do want to thank uh, participation for those who came on a snow day to the public forum. So we had a little less attendance this time than last time, but I think the people really enjoyed the focus on the academic presentation and gave us some good insights into what they were thinking. So thanks to those who came to the forum. Uh, I didn't ever want to be a video person that takes 30 second videos, but it seems to be a popular thing. Uh, I do get a lot of feedback. Uh, to extend that video, uh, I'm meeting with, well, I'm going up to Andy Barrier's classroom in the high school with the students who run a radio show, and they're collecting questions from the public, and I'm gonna do a Q&A on the radio show, um, and then a short podcast will follow two weeks later. So I'm gonna continue pushing out communications through the video. The short Q&A on the radio, um, I forget the name of the radio station, WM, anybody know our radio station? MER, WMER? Um, okay. Is that what it is, is that the number? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna keep pushing out information about the school district to keep educating the public. So thanks for your support for that. Again, I didn't wanna be a video or radio star, but it turns out it's popular, so. Um, and thanks to everyone for being patient through the delay to cancellations. We usually like to call them the night before, uh, but thank goodness um, we canceled today. It was a rough morning. I'm not gonna blame the weather people, but they got that one wrong, I think. It was a little dicey. Mm -hmm. uh, driving from Hanover, it was two and a half hours for me to get here this morning, so it was a long ride. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a discussion item, and I'm gonna defer the rest of my report time to a discussion item under new business about our snow makeup days. So we are now three days in. Do we have school the last three, three more days in June or do we uh, focus on professional development and other options moving forward? So I want a little feedback from the board. I don't wanna make that decision by myself. I have some thoughts, but um, I wanna talk to you about that in public under new discussion. End of report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Berger. Um, I'll go a little bit further out on the limb. The weatherman and people, the weather professionals, they did get it wrong, uh, but you got it right, so don't apologize for the timeline. Um, anyone who traveled Interstate 81 this morning would realize it was a parking lot for two and a half hours from 6.30 till 8.30, but anyway. Uh, we did uh, finish up with uh, Dr. Sherry Smith uh, previously on the district goals. Um, that was a great exercise, I think, for everyone, uh, the board, uh, for Chris and his team, and the district as a whole. Um, in my 11 years on the board, uh, the goals have been very vague, uh, I'll say. And uh, now, as a board, uh, the other thing we, well, I'll go there next. Uh, the next step on district goals now as a board is it's our turn to take that half a step back and allow Chris and his team to take care of the what uh, and the how and, and let them develop the plan and the actions to, to get us to those district goals. However, as board, it's not over because we started into board goals also with Dr. Smith in the last session. And that's gonna be part of our workshop continuation I mentioned earlier tonight. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at what we came up with and, and talk about them. Um, my other part is 
and this sort of goes to board goals and processes, but it's also for the public. Uh, you've, if you haven't noticed, the agendas and the meetings flow different now. And I can't stress this enough that especially this first meeting of the month, the committee of the whole meeting, uh, and Chris mentioned it earlier, new business. That new business line is a perfect opportunity for board members to also add new business, any, any board member. Or it might not be new business, it may show up uh, a little sooner in the agenda as this one does tonight. And the, the theory behind this is that these items become a three, at least a three-step process. And the first process would be, right, it gets discussed tonight at a committee of the whole. In public, with the team of 10, all sitting here discussing it, debating it, uh, whatever you want to call it. Then we decide as a board of nine and team of 10 whether that's a topic we want to maybe pursue a little further. And that's the decision we would make tonight on such an item. And it then it reverts primarily back to Chris and his team to put together information to bring back to the board, probably for another committee of the whole meeting, at which time then we would decide, yeah, we want to go forward with action on this. And that would move forward to a regular voting item, which would be the step three. Now, at any step in that process, what we all have to be re you know, cognizant of and respectful for, at some point, it may become majority no, and we have to walk away from it at that point. That's going to be tough. It's going to be very tough, and, uh, but it's something we need to do and to keep the process, I think, moving efficiently. So with that, um, we move into the consent agenda items. 4.01, <coughs> Phoenix Physical Therapy, Mr. Woodman. Oh, I'm sorry. Was Mr. there going to be? I yeah, I we missed, the, I missed the audible. Yeah. That's what happens. We're going to call an audible tonight. Um, we're going to move what was item 6.02 up to the next item for the proposed uh, pr proposed budget. Mrs. Stauffer and Mrs. Nolt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bigger and board leadership for allowing us to move the presentation to a little earlier in the, uh, the board meeting. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about the 24-25 uh, budget projection. Our purpose this year is to create a sustainable and stable educational program. Next slide. So just a quick review from uh, January when we met. We talked about uh, categories of revenue and categories of expenditures. Our revenue is um, put into three major buckets. One is local, the other is state, and finally federal. Uh, we account for our expenditures either by major objects, such as salary, benefits, contracts, or major functions, such as instruction and support services. We talked about the projected unaudited fund balance for 22-23. And if you recall, we talked about the differences of those fund balances and what we are allowed to use them for. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then we talked about the 24-25 budget timeline. Next slide. For this evening, uh, we're going to cover our expenditure assumptions, what has been built into this for first forecast. We'll also talk about our revenue assumptions, what the projected surplus deficit is, and our next step. So looking again that our goal is to be sustainable and stable with this forecast. Um, the first area are we identified were employee contracts, salary, and benefits. Our projected pay increases on the positions only is roughly 3% or $2 million. Our health care is forecasted to increase by 7% or $1.6 million. Dental vision is um, estimated to increase by $45,000. And believe it or not, for those of you who have been around, we actually had a decrease to our PISA rate coming into 24-25 of 0.10%. However, that is still going to show a $700,000 addition to, to the budget, and that's just purely tied to salaries going up. Um, the second area that we talked about and included in this assumption is the capital reserve resolution. 
the 1% for future facility enhancements. If you recall, last June, um, the board approved that. Uh, we do have that line item in the 23-24, so to increase to uh, the 1% for 24-25 would be another $81,000. And we're also seeing a 9% increase in debt service, and this is primarily tied to the 2023 bond. And then finally, the category that we're, we're calling increases due to inflation are just the cost of doing business. Um, we're looking at a liability insurance uh, increase of about 10% or $53,000. We've increased instruction by 3,560,000 and support services by just a little over 1.3 million. Next slide, Danette. So to summarize these, you're looking at employee contracts and benefits at just around 4.3 million, debt service and the uh, capital reserve resolution, a million 23, and then increases due to inflation or the cost of doing business of just under $5 million. Total expenditure increases into the 24-25 budget, $10,301,000. Do want to point out that this budget has removed all ESSER's revenue and expenditures as that is, is expiring. Next slide. So moving on to our revenue assumptions, you know, one of the first things that Danette and I do, and she's going to get up here and share the limelight a little bit here later on, is we look at our trends and we look at where things are and where things are going. So. Our interim real estate taxes have been pretty pretty good the last couple of years, so we've increased that by $100,000. EIT, earned income tax, we're basing that on the trend of increase of 1.5 million. Interest revenue, we increased based on trend by 400,000. And then revenue from pass-through funds, and you'll see an asterisk there, and I'll talk a little bit uh, later about that, what that asterisk means in terms of revenue. So looking at our real estate taxes, this first forecast includes a 3% for operating expense and a 1% for the capital reserve facility enhancement uh, transfer. So 4% uh, generates a little over $4.3 million. And just as a reminder, this year the Act 1 maximum potential tax increase is 7%. That would generate just around $8.1 million. We are still seeing our assessment base grow, which is a good thing for us. Uh, we're forecasting a 1% growth for the assessment base, collection rate at 98%. Um, should the board approve this budget, we'd be looking at a mill rate of one point, or excuse me, 132.4931. Value of the mill, 771,000. Collected mill, 756,000. Next slide, Danette. Okay, so again, moving now into the state sources. Um, I don't know if anybody had the opportunity to listen to Governor Shapiro, I almost said Wolf again, but yeah. Governor Shapiro's budget. Um, it's very aggressive, uh, again, this year. So we have done what we've done in the past, which we have level funded the major streams of, of state revenue, which is basic ed, special ed, state pax, taxpayer relief, and the ready to learn block grant. I do wanna point out, when I say level funded, I'm leveling it at the actual, because if you recall the 23-24 budget, we did not have that in there, so it was about 3.5 million. Pre-K counts is increasing by 364,000. Our transportation subsidy, 300,000. PSER subsidy increasing by 322,000. And then our Social Security uh, subsidy, about 78,000. Moving to the federal sources, um, again, if you recall back to uh, last year's presentation, we had about $10 million budgeted in federal sources from ESSERS. That has been removed. So we are looking at the Title I, which supports our disadvantaged students, academic. Title II, which supports effective instruction. <coughs> Title III, which <coughs> supports our English language learners. And Title IV, um, I kind of call this the everything under the kitchen sink title because it really does give you a lot of flexibility. Anything that su can support student support or academic enrichment. So we've actualized those numbers. Um, we've also seen a slight increase in our medical access by 100,000. Next slide, Nick. So looking at our revenue assumptions, at local sources, we would generate just around 6.4 million. State sources, 701. And again, that doesn't include Governor Shapiro's proposal, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, and the federal sources of $100,000. So just around $7.2 million. If you note the revenue sources with an asterisk, those are increased by um, offsetting expenditures in the budget. It's not extra money. We have to expend it the way that they tell us to. Okay. 
So governor's proposal, um, again, he presented this on February 6th. If you look at this, the basic ed subsidy, he's projecting an $8.4 million increase are just under 29%. Special ed, another 252,000 or 4.65%. So if this would come to fruition, and we're really a long ways away before we'll know what we'll get from the state, for those who have been around, you know that, um, we're looking at just around 8.7 million. Um, the other thing that the governor's budget did was it's proposing to alter the way that we fund our charter schools. Um, currently, our regular ed charter schools, we spend about $11,700. The governor's proposal is estimating $8,000 per student. So you can see on the regular ed, if that would come through, we'd have a savings of about 470 And that's cyber school? Yes, not, cyber not charter. Orders, cyber, yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, for the special ed category, there was really nothing in the address that talked on about it. So what we did is we adjusted the special ed calculation by the amount that we adjusted the regular ed. And so if that would come about, we'd be looking at special ed savings of around 2.25 million for a total of just under 1.7 million. Okay, I'm forget when you're coming in. Is it the next one? No. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so our forecast, if you take a look at this with all the assumptions in there, right now we're, we're uh, forecasting a slight deficit. And I, I know $829,000 sounds like a lot of money, but when you have a $185 million budget, it is a slight deficit. Um, and I do believe that that deficit will close as we move through the summer and, uh, sorry, the spring, and we update our assessment base and we get a little more information. Assuming that we add no more expenditures, I think that deficit could close to zero uh, for the final budget, assuming we add no more expenditures. So, next slide, Danette. So, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the fund balance because Chris and I have had a lot of conversations about fund balance and really a healthy fund balance is needed to sustain our educational program. And I don't know if anybody was around in 08, 09 during the Great Recession, but it was not a fun time in Chambersburg. Um, unemployment hit 10%, uh, home prices fell by 30%, the S&P 500 was down by 57%. And so what Chambersburg had to do, because we didn't have a healthy fund balance, is we cut programming. We cut driver's ed, we cut middle level family consumer sciences, and we eliminated about 70 position, positions. So, Having a sustainable, healthy fund balance will kind of avoid that. Um, knowing that we're an Act One school district, meaning we we push earned our real estate tax burden to earned income tax. As soon as the economy starts to take a downturn, we will be hit faster than our neighbor districts because it is more volatile than real estate. So we do have to be mindful of that. Uh, right now, things are good. We we don't know how long that will be good because the economy is cyclical. Okay, Danette. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Ned for a couple of minutes. Good evening. I'm not used to being up here for this, uh, so just bear with me. Um, so Tammy talked about the assumption, assumptions that we used um, to do the projection for the 24-25 budget. So this slide right here is showing um, at, f at 4% increase in the tax revenue, we would be generating about $4.4 .4 million. You can see uh, the different percentages that we projected at. There's about a $965,000 difference between each of those percentages. You also see at 0%, we're still generating additional revenue. And that's because the assessment base continues to grow. So you would definitely see see that. Next slide. Okay, so as Tammy also indicated, um, we're showing a slight deficit of about $830,000. Um, and as she also said, uh, we do believe that that will close. But you can see there at the, at the different percentages uh, what how that deficit increases as, as we choose um, our different tax rates. Next slide. Okay, so this is the composition of our funding. Uh, you can see um, that the local and the state revenues um, make up 95% of our revenue. Uh, you also see that the federal sources there are a very small piece of the pie, and as Tammy alluded to earlier, the ESSER funding has been removed from that. 
Next slide. Okay, so for our expenditures, we categorize those in two ways, one by object and two by function. So this slide shows you by object, which is like the salaries and benefits and purchases. Um, and so you can see that those three categories make up 85% of our budget. Next slide, please. So this is um, a breakdown of the expenditures by function. You can see that the instruction is about 62%. The support services falls behind in about 27%, about but just keep in mind that, that the support services also support our students. So you would see um, things like guidance and nursing would fall into that category. Next slide. Okay, so let's jump over to the homestead farmstead. So for this year, the 23-24 year, we had um, 30,500 taxable properties. Of those properties, 100, 100, 18,000, a little over 18,000 properties were qualified for the homestead farmstead. So when we did the calculations, um, the exclusion value was $797.76. So that's what folks saw on their tax bills this year. So we decided to project based on those same property um, numbers, and at this time we're projecting that our exclusion value will go up by about $50. Next slide. Okay, so for forecast two, we will be presenting in um, April, I believe it's April 9th. I wanna say that's the first meeting. And what you can anticipate uh, seeing in that forecast would be assessment-based changes, either due to growth or appeals or exonerations. Uh, we'll continue to watch earned income tax. We watch that on a monthly basis and see where the trends are. We'll continue to watch the trends on the interest revenue. Uh, some of you probably recall many years ago, well not that many years, maybe four, where interest revenue was really bad. It was like 0.1% or something. It was crazy. But now it's, it's rebound, and that's a good uh, source for us. And then the state allocations, and the big question for that is when? When will we know? Um, in past years, we've not known before the board has had to approve the budget in June. Um, the governor usually comes through around the end of June, beginning of July. So more than likely, we will not know. And then finally, if there's any additional expenditure needs from the educational side, those will be added into the forecast. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So our next step, again, we're going to present to you all on April 9th, the proposed uh, budget forecast two. Uh, May 1st is a day that we like to keep our eye on. That's when the state uh, tells us how much slot money they're going to give us for our earned income tax. We'll also know at that point how many homesteads have qualified. We'll bring forward to the board on May 7th a proposed final budget. And I do wanna emphasize it's proposed, no tax increases, set until we vote on the final budget in June. And then um, after that proposed is voted on, we will display and advertise and bring the final budget forward on June 4th. And that's it. Any questions? No? Okay. Really? Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm just curious to know, um, there is there is funding in here for increases due to inflation, cost of doing business, instruction increases by 3.5. I'm I'm curious to know like what what is included in that. Support services increases by 1.3. Mm -hmm. um, I remember last year at our audit, we learned that the school district is investing $3,000 less per student than other school districts within our LIU. So that's 25 districts within a three county area. And so that means if I'm a teacher and I'm standing in front of 25 kids, I'm short 75 grand. I would love to hear analysis from the administration. What does that, wh where is that 75 grand, like ha where are we uh, giving our kids the short end of the stick? <laughs> is, it, is it that the teachers are paid less? Is it benefits? Is it facilities? Is it support? Is it resources? What? Where, where is that? And then I'm curious to know, does this budget do anything to help close that gap, right? Um, I'm also aware that our classroom sizes are relatively large compared to other school districts in the state. Does this 
particular budget do anything to help us on that front? So um, I'll answer the first part, which right, is yeah, um, yeah. what's added into the instructional side. The majority of that money is special ed, around $2.6 million in special ed. We did add another million to cyber charter schools because as our per student tuition rates go up, what I pay the charter schools go up. And so we've seen a pretty big growth in special ed. And right now we're, we're funding cyber charter schools at just under 27 or under $28,000 per special ed cyber charter school. Mm -hmm. So those are the two big buckets. Um, there was a little bit of money put in there, I think around 10,000 for uh, CBA. And then I also included which it doesn't really go into instruction, but for me I thought it fit better was athletics. They, they need about $50,000 to continue the existing mm -hmm. program. So those are the, the components of that. Um, on the support side, these are increases that for the most part, they're gonna happen whether we budget them or not. So the borough increased their um, electric rates. Um, I think it went up 11.3% Matt. The stormwater runoff, those types of things, they're gonna happen whether we put them in the budget or not. Um, contracts are going up, so a lot of that is to support those areas and buildings and ground safety, uh, just increases in, in what we currently have in the budget. Um, so, so if I'm understanding correctly, it doesn't really address my concern that we are shortchanging our kids. I don't know that I can really answer that. I don't I can. <laughs> okay. So, so we, we're focusing on a stable and sustainable budget is trying to backfill decisions that were made to make sure we can sustain them right now. Yep. We haven't looked to forward anything. Y you do know, and I think we've made it uh, very public, we're studying ESL programming. Mm -hmm. So as the budget evolves, we might not be ready to say what we're going to do with our ESL programming, but we will probably allocate resources for it. Mm -hmm. It just depends on where we end with any additional state money or not. Special education is one area that Kurt and Sheree are diving into and trying to uncover so we can get better at projecting what comes every year versus reacting to it. Um, and we're finding out the reasons why. So we're still doing a lot of studying internally before we're ready to say this is where we're headed. So I've held off some of those uh, areas that you've, uh, you've brought up only because I don't think we're fully ready to forward the programs yet because of study. Right. So it's not like the, the additional expenditures aren't coming to address some of the areas. We are just not ready to put them forward now. Yeah. Just from my view. Do you anticipate some of that being figured out by April 9th? No. ESL maybe. We have two visits this month. So ESL would be a maybe, and special education would be perhaps as well. If those two areas were tighter on, then we're going to know uh, where we have other areas to go down. But a, a great example were the OCR resources uh, where we used Esther's funds four years from now. There's a, a, a big item coming, a funding cliff or a, a $4 million item. You got to start putting a half million dollars aside. I think that's included in this budget. I think, so. I think that one is. So we're trying to backfill. We have a technology concerns and worries. So there's no shortage of worries coming mm -hmm. my way. Um, but I think the challenge we have is to organize them all and prioritize them so that we can present them to you in some package. Because mm -hmm. um, um, there's, there's a lot of priorities right now and there's a lot of options. And we want to get what's most important in front of you first, mm -hmm. from our view. <coughs> Do you? Uh, d uh, another question I have: um, <coughs> Does this budget help us address any of our concerns? With we have 90 openings, and we have quite a few of those positions are really low wage, and I, I would love to see that change. I've been talking about this for a couple of years. Is there anything in this budget that could help us to get the, to that goal? You will be able to help us with uh, uh, Mrs. Clever and I are working on all those contracts. Mm -hmm. So they will be coming to you. We have how many up could you review just for the public and the board? Just go through them if you could. Sorry about that. Good evening. So currently um, we have six agreements that are going to be expiring June 30th of this year. Mm -hmm. And those agreements include the agreement with our non-bargaining group. It also includes food service, transportation, our Act 93, our school psychologists, and our uh, NJROTC. So we, we have a very busy uh, first six months of 2024, but 
Um, Mr. Aber, we definitely have taken your comments and other comments from the board and from our community and especially from our staff, mm -hmm. and we are examining what we can do um, because I know Mr. Bigger and myself will be the first to say we need to make a change and we need to get those up. So in terms of contracts, there's six that are coming our way. Custodians, not included. PCAs, not included. TAs, not included. Am I, am I tracking correctly? So again, what we have this year are agreements. They're not collective bargaining agreements. There's, there's a little bit of a, a nuanced difference to them. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, will have the uh, SESPA contract that will expire next June of 2025 and that uh, collective bargaining agreement includes the PCAs and the um, TAs. The AFSCME agreement that was actually, I think I'm looking at Mrs. Stauffer, we just settled that last year um, uh, with that one as well. So that one I don't believe comes up until June of 2026. Mm -hmm. Uh, other questions I, ha I heard about science curriculum earlier tonight. Are we budgeting anything for that? Um, I also think about reading by third grade. That's something a lot of us care about. What does this budget do to help us improve those numbers? Does it, you know, is there anything concrete that's built in? Hey, here's what we're going to do to really improve. Does it help us move caches mm -hmm. off of ATSI? What, like, how are we investing our dollars so that this? <laughs> thing that we've been under for years now it is removed. I mean, I, I would love to see that. Um, why, are, why are we under an improvement plan for years on end? W what are we doing as a board to invest in this school that has been struggling? Not every student, obviously, but in many respects, it's been struggling and the state sees that and I don't wanna stay on that. So, but it's gonna require us as a board to say, we're gonna invest in these particular ways, and I would love recommendations from the administration on that front. Um, here's what we could do that would really help to solve this particular issue we have. So. Yeah, uh, Tammy, a question I have is, um, when you were playing around with the tax rates mm -hmm. and what generate revenue and you know deficit, how it impacts deficits and so forth, um, why stop at 4% when theoretically you can go to 7%? percent not suggesting we should do that, but why, why stop at 4? I, I wouldn't let her. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I left it at 4. Uh, this is our first draft at it. This is why there's a budget process. Okay. So don't blame her. Blame me on that one. <laughs> Got it. And, and for the math teachers in the district, 1% is 900,000 roughly. So there's your answer. 945,000? 965. 965. Any other questions, comments? So I, I think I'm understanding the answer to a lot of my questions is that no, as is, right. there's not currently anything on this. I would love to hear some recommendations at a future meeting about many of those points, if, if that's, and, and then as a board, you know, we can yeah. up or down. Yep. But right now it seems like we have these major issues that we're doing nothing about. This is our annual time within our cycle to say, let's, let's try to improve on this front. Um, we're doing a disservice to our kids if we leave them short. I guess I have a question as well. Um, coming from the business world and knowing how we do our things, and I realize this is a totally different monster. But we are constantly undergoing, we own a machine shop. Every week we know steel prices are moving and we are constantly using some of our different vendors to account for that. And I know that that's a lot of legwork and these kind of things, but I'm wondering through your process, do you guys go through and look at, I remember seeing something on one of the line items when I first started coming to the board meetings last year. And it was like something in the athletics and the the, unif the coaches' uniforms or something, and I thought it was an astronomical amount to be spending on that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Does each department go through and look where they could be cutting or where they could be adjusting and then bring that back to you guys? And I'm not trying to make any more work, but if, if we're going to try to accommodate and try to really look at things, it seems to me like instead of just 
taxing to the max to get what we want to do or doing this or doing that? Are there things that, that each department is looking at as far as are we really getting a return on investment for this or are we just sticking with the status quo and continuing things that maybe aren't as beneficial as they once were? Uh, you know, I'm just kind of looking into that process, not challenging, but just curious about it, if I, if I may ask that. Yeah, I, I, and I will answer that in, um, from this standpoint. We ask the departments to build a zero-based budget. You know, start at zero, build what you need. Um, the last decade, Danette, or close, we've not let departments increase their budgets unless there's been a really powerful justification for doing that. Um, you can't operate like that um, because to your point about athletics, um, the transportation is going to go up, mm -hmm. the cost of replacing equipment is going to go up. So we did allow some of that into this budget. And again, this goes back to our fund balance. There were many years where we did not have a healthy fund balance and we couldn't let them because until we got to the point where we added in all the contractual increases, there was nothing left to give them. Mm -hmm. So I'll answer that in the way that that's what they're to do uh, whether they all do that or not, I, I can't answer that. But that is our direction to the department uh, managers and the ones who have fiscal responsibility. Just restate, 10 years they've been flat funded the budgets across. It's probably the been 10 years. Right. Yeah, close to that. Yeah, just we say a decade uh, flat. Yes. So and some, some of the expenditures were increasing the budgets this year in our proposal. Yeah, we just yeah. have not allowed them to do that without going through their senior leadership and their being, you know, for lack of a better wor word, we battle over what else we're adding in because there just isn't enough for everything. And that's kind of where we've been for the last decade, I'd say. And as they presented, the lion's share of our budgets, staff and personnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's where everything falls. So the majority of what we do, increase and decrease, is going to fall on staff, salary, and benefits. So does your staff and personnel include the proposed contracts that we're going to be doing? Uh, estimated at 3%. Okay. Because we don't have those rates. If we have an actual work agreement or contract, we've actualized those. Okay. But for ones we don't have work agreement, we did 3%. So that okay. could be more or less. It's just that's what number we've, we've used for this forecast. And, and to piggyback on that, Ben, you know, to respond back to you, one of the stable and sustainable budgets is contracts first, our employees first. So I don't feel good bringing a bunch of expenditures on the other end until we settle the contracts. So I think that's our first priority with staff and positions. It's pointless to have new <coughs> programs if we don't have people to deliver them. And so uh, this next two months are going to be really heavy on the board and us to make those decisions. And then we'll see where we land with uh, expenditures. I, I actually think that addressing some of these things would improve our yeah. stability and yeah. sustainability. I mean, you can't have – we've had 90 openings for how long? Mm -hmm. you know, and it's fluctuated between 70 and 100 and something. But – you know, if we really care about sustainability and stability, we 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 can't s continue to ignore all of these issues. Is is how I feel about it. <coughs> Other questions? Good discussions. Just want to add one more while we're, you know, it's budget and we're throwing numbers and we're throwing statistics around, um, and we've often talked about this cost per student number. Uh, it comes up a lot. Um, the one number, and I'll have to research it myself, and, and I'll bring that forward too, but there is one other number in this equation that never gets talked about. I just learned about this myself about three months ago, that the, in Chambersburg, we are above the norm in our tax. Right? They, they track your tax versus your student population. So our overall tax is above the average. So what keep keep that in mind. You know, what, what, so there's there's many different to? funding streams. Yeah, what are you referring to specifically? Uh, it's in I think we're at one point oh two. The mean is one. Where our tax. So you know the average is at one. You're we saying within the state the average is at one? Yes. And we're at one point oh two. Yeah. So but so we're talking are, about real we estate, are, we you're talking about EIT. We are let me finish, please. Uh, we are taxing above the average. So we always hear that we are underfunding. Well, we are overtaxing then if we are underfunding. Uh, can you clarify what you, 
like in what ways are we overtaxing? I'll research that and I'll bring that information yeah. forward. Is there not also something with economy of scale with our district being much larger where it's more economical? I'm not a business person. Tammy, is that not a factual? Yeah, I mean, obviously you, you do get economies of scales, especially like in our food service program. That's why we've always been able to run in the black, so to speak, because we had such a large operation. And, and um, you know, if you have one school that's not making it, the other schools are gonna kind of carry it. So there are economies of scales. Uh, we've never sat, I'll be honest, we've never sat down and tried to figure those things out. Um, I just don't really have enough accountants to do that, but no. um, you can assume that the larger you get, uh, that there will be some economies of scale. Right, and, and so the per cost decreases because you have a bigger district it could it could be it could be tied to you know how we do our electives it could be tied to a lot of different factors like how we um, do our specials there's just a lot of different factors that go in you can't really you can look at a cost per student but I don't know that it honestly gives you an accurate representation exactly. it's just across the board um, like I said you know for us they calculate our special ed costs per student that we're paying our cyber charter schools is just under $28,000. So for every cyber charter special needs child that goes, that's what we're paying. Now, in the district, is every car child costing us $28,000? No, there's some above, some below, you know, some are that way, some are low. Faye, I think that's an interesting point. I, uh, the last time I looked at statewide data, remember there's 500 districts in the state, or the 20th largest, if you look at the 50 largest, the last time I looked at statewide data, of those 50, we were still 48th out of 50 in terms of what we were spending for students. So if there, was econo if there are economies for scale for us, there's economies of scale for all those other large districts and somehow we're still <laughs> all the way at the bottom, not, not, not dead last, but 48th. Um, so I would assume that they have the same benefits and somehow we're still ending up all the way down. Yeah, and to elaborate on Ben's question, um, Mr. President, um, I guess if we're overtaxing our residents, then we're spending $3,000 less per person. Where is the money going? I'm sure doing the research, maybe you could research that too. Yeah. You know the total budget is not calculated in dollars per student. Are you aware of that? You don't take a hundred and what's our budget? Hundred and all right. You don't take one hundred eighty-five million divided by the students. That's not how the no, numbers no, arrive there. So there are other factors in there. Primary one is capital and projects. So I'd say that's probably the biggest driver. Any other questions? Thank you again, Mrs. Stauffer, Mrs. Knowles. Thank you, and thank you. Okay, 4.01, Phoenix Physical Therapy. Mr. Whitman. Yes, this is a uh, multi-year contract for Phoenix Physical Therapy. Um, it is a three-year contract. The first year, a 0% uh, increase, and then the next two years are a 1% increase for each one of these years. Uh, we've been working with uh, Phoenix Physical Therapy since, I believe, 2002. Uh, they work, many with our special needs students, on PT. Questions for Mr. Whitman? go through these pretty quickly. If there's no questions or discussions, we will obviously move forward to our next meeting. 4.02, story grammar marker training. This is a proposal for uh, some of our special education staff who work with a specific student to get trained 
on a uh, specific strategy on a bridge to literacy for one of our special ed students. Um, it, the uh, explanation, I believe, is attached about the story grammar marker. Questions? 4.03, Hoffman Homes Contracts Statement of Work. These are two contracts and states, statements of work for two special ed students that were placed at uh, Hoffman Academy, uh, just for board knowledge. Normally we do not place students there. They are placed by an outside agency, but we're responsible if they are, live in our district for their education, and this is the case with these two students. Four point oh four. Health contract. Yeah, four point oh four is a uh, contract to uh, with Soliant for a uh, a nurse for one of our uh, special needs students. He needs to have nursing care while at school. I'm going to just pause. I won't ask for comments. But if there's no comments, then we'll move on. Okay, 4.05, student reinstatements. Um, actually, Dr. Long, we, we spoke in an executive session mm -hmm. about these, specifically yep. about these two students coming back. Yep, so we'll move that one forward. Yep. Special education settlement agreement. Once again, thing. that was same part thing. of executive session for yeah. litigation, yep. So if there are any additional questions that you have, let us know, we'll do executive session We'll make sure we include these two items or any questions you have in executive session before our next meeting. Uh, but these will be voting items at our next meeting. Creation of Eco Warriors Club at Cassius. Dr. This Long. Is, this is a club that they would like to start. Um, they have been running it for um, a couple years now, and uh, they, they just want to make this a, a formal club. Um, we're actually using the writer's workshop stipend to um, fund this club as well. There will be five stipends out of that one club that's not running any longer. Yeah, I've got a question on this. On this uh, so, do they have a, um, a vision to go beyond just what they're doing now, like to look at more ways to save paper and other things within the operation of the school district, or is it just limited to a shack collecting newspapers and stuff like that? Uh, are they, they're, they have a vision to do uh, more things. Um, it's just more than just the newspapers there. Yeah, good. Um, th they just need some funding and things. That's why they wanted to make it a club, so they can get some funds in there, and they can do different things. Great. Thank you. I'm very supportive of the student clubs, and I'm especially pleased to see that an inactive club is being dissolved and money is being used for another club. There seemed on a report that we got some months ago to be quite a few clubs that appeared to be somewhat inactive. Has there been any evaluation of how many of those clubs are no longer functional? Yes, we are. Um, I had the principals um, look at that when we talked about it before. Um, and actually, we are going to have a couple more clubs uh, coming up in the next meeting. Uh, I just received today that we're going to close a couple clubs in order to get a couple more clubs in that teachers have been running without doing a stipend and things like that for a while. Um, so, yes, yes, we, we have been reviewing those. Okay, 4.09, Unique Field Trip Drama Club. Um, 4.08 was the archive, so we're, we're okay with that? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Archives of writers, yes. Okay, um, and the, the money that was in the, stu um, in the pot, so to speak, for that club is going to the student government. A unique Field Trip for the Drama Club, that's on May 11th. Uh, once again, they're going to go see a Broadway show in New York City, and that's on a Saturday. No cost to the district. 
Uh, the student government would like to go to Washington, D.C., also no cost to the district. I have a state field trip, Children Aid, Children's Aid Society. Mr. Woodman. Yes, we have, uh, they're in the teens, the amount of students that are currently at the Children's Aid Society, and they are going to be using the uh, title monies for neglected uh, students to take a field trip to the Chake, uh, Chesapeake Shakespeare Company and National Aquarium in Baltimore, Maryland. River Rock. Yep, just the policy. Four point twelve River yeah. Rock contract approval. Um, for the last several years, we've been using River Rock for students that we uh, place. Some of our students that we expel, um, and this is the next year's contract for the River Rock, um, and it's an increase of forty-one thousand eight hundred and fifty-six dollars uh, for to keep our spots at uh, twenty-five. Of note in the contract, uh, they are working on finding a closer location, um, which would definitely help our, uh, we pay $231,000 uh, for transportation. That would significantly reduce the cost. Uh, these students travel about 45 minutes a day. The location that they're looking uh, is actually within CASD, so that would help us quite a bit. And they would reduce our rate, if you saw in the contract, that uh, if they open up Closer. So. Twenty-five. Yeah. yeah, we have twenty-five yeah. students yeah. there. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Four point thirteen. Folding contract addendum. Therapist. Yes. Uh, we received, we wrote a grant for the, through the Pennsylvania Crime uh, Commission, Commission on Crime and Delinquency, and we, the board previously approved that contract uh, with Folium to provide one and a half therapists to work with our kids. Uh, the, our counselors give names to kids that need a little bit more therapy than what our counselors can provide. Uh, the monies that we received from Pennsylvania came late, you know, and so we need to extend that contract because we definitely want to use up the money and there is definitely a need for our kids to receive more uh, intensive therapy. And so it may even go into the summer for some of our kids that are already getting therapy. And uh, hopefully we'll be bringing uh, some new news with PCCD uh, grant. We're getting some guaranteed money, but we're also applying for uh, a competitive grant and we'd hopefully uh, might get some of those monies as well. So it's a good thing. Basically, this is just to extend it. It's no cost to the district because we're using grant money. We're just extending the contract with Folium to provide a therapist. All right. Moving on to education and services, 5.01 core standards and academic requirements by <coughs> division. Mr. Widman and Dr. Long. Is the clicker still over here? Yes. Mr. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good evening. Uh, this evening we're going to be talking, I uh, just want to talk about our educational programs at the elementary, middle school, and secondary divisions. What students take. Uh, course-wise and what a typical day looks like for our students. It starts with Chapter 4 of the PA School Code. It's very limited on what the school code says. We get our standards handed down from the state that gets a little bit more in-depth, but the school code basically says we have to ha provide planned instruction and aligned with academic standards in the following areas. So we have language arts, mathematics, science, technology and engineering, social studies, health and safety and physical education, and of course the arts. And that's for all three levels. I pulled this out of uh, chapter four just to <coughs> show you what the elementary division looks like, but it basically says the same thing in each division. An elementary day, typical for our students in K through five, is 90 minutes of English language arts, then they have roughly 30 to 40 minutes of writing as well. 
Math generally is around 90 minutes. Science, 40. Social studies, 40. They have specials four times a week, art, music, phys ed, and library. Uh, lunch every day for 30 minutes. Uh, recess, 30 minutes. Um, and some of the schools do it a little bit differently, but uh, K-1-2 has two 15-minute recesses at many of our buildings, and then 3, 4, 5 generally has one 30-minute time. Uh, students have the ability to take instrumental music lessons, uh, belong to STEM clubs. There are interventions happening at every building. Uh, this is the first year that we every building has at least one full-time interventionist in it. Our larger buildings have multiple interventionists in it. And uh, SEL is two times a week through positive action lessons. So that's mo social emotional learning. Excuse the middle me, school Mr. Whitman. Uh, the, the writing uh, 30, 40 minutes is on top of the 90 minutes yes. e ELA. Okay. That, that's correct. Okay, thank you, sir. Now, is, is the science a half semester or, or a half year? That's, it's half year and social studies is yeah, half a so year. That's correct. Middle schools, uh, they have one hour each core for ELA, math, science, and social studies. They have two specials each day. And the specials, over their three years, they will take health twice. So it could be sixth and eighth grade or sixth and seventh grade. Because of the staffing, they have to, to work it out, but they'll have two health classes. They'll have PE, physical education, all three years. Art, they'll have two years while they're in the middle school. Music, twice. Tech ed, twice. Business, the e-learning, and the careers course. They'll have two separate uh, years of taking those courses. Ag science and an introduction to world language, which they have an introduction to all the, the uh, foreign languages that they teach at the high school to generate interest, interest for our kids. Uh, there are interventions and enrichments that, that also take place uh, during that specials time, and uh, they have the opportunity to be in band as well as gifted during that specials time. So those, those 45 minutes that happen twice a day when they're not in their, their cores, all those classes can be taking place. So it's a big puzzle to put that together for the middle schools. The typical middle school schedule, uh, the kids arrive, they have to be there by 8 o'clock. They have a homeroom or activity period. That's when band, orchestra, chorus, clubs, and students that need extra help or students that just need to check in with the teacher happens during that activities period. Then they would have, you see up there, one, two, three, and four of the cores. It could be different times during the day for different grades. Uh, I just pulled one grade out of uh, one of the middle schools here to show. And then they'd have related arts. You see lunch, and then they have a second related arts. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Long right now, and he's going to talk about programming at the high school. Thank you, sir. Um, what we have is uh, a picture here of the four options for our high school students, um, and I would like to go through each and every one of them. Um, high school, um, across the street on McKinley Street and 4th Street. I almost made that mistake. 6th Street, actually. Sorry. Um, the total enrollment of that school, if you take every kid that's enrolled in our system is 2,320. But um, the, the students that go to that school is 2,082 right now because we have some that are in another the virtual academy. But within the high school, they have a comprehensive uh, schedule, 9 through 12. It's a block or it's a um, skinny schedule. We call them skinnies. They're single periods, so there's seven periods a day. They're 47 minutes each. Uh, fourth period is longer. It's 90 minutes because they put a uh, wave lunch in that as well. So there's actually a 15 minute gap and they put uh, mentor time in there for students to get mentored by their teacher. Um, it's working well for the teachers that are actually putting the effort through um, good mentoring there. And they're working on that throughout, um, getting the others trained and things like that. But they have extensive uh, um, electives for the students. They have over 100 electives that the students can choose from. Um, and basically, uh, the school is very, very good. Um, it has many different programs in it that students can get involved with. Um, but, you know, size sometimes scares people. But the way they have it laid out, each floor is a different grade level. Um, now, the grade levels do have to intermingle to go to phys ed and things like that for some of the electives. But like ninth grade is on one floor, and they, they mainly stay there for their four cores. 
Uh, the virtual academy is a, an option. The, the academy is a program. It is not a school. The state will not recognize any uh, school district virtual academies as a school. So it is a program within. Um, so right now we have 355 full-time students um, with a total of 488 blended and full-time students. Um, Mrs. Minier is the director of this. Um, she just told me as well that she has 210 um, credit recovery students at the high school level taking courses through them as well. So she's close to 700 total students if you want a total there. Um, it is an online option for our students to take. Uh, we are getting more blended approach as far as some of the kids need just a couple credits and they can't fit into their schedule because they're working as well. So they'll take a uh, credit or two uh, through Mrs. Minier uh, in the online program. You get a, a CASD diploma at the end if you go through that program. And also you can do uh, many, all the different things at the high school. We have students that are coming in for glee club, um, for band, for orchestra, um, and many different things like that. So it's a great program and it also helps us keep those kids in our district instead of sending them out to cybers. The Career Magnet School is the uh, second high school. It's connected to the uh, Franklin County Career and Technology Center. Um, the total right now of students in that school is 668. Um, they have a few students that are going to the virtual academy as well. That is a STEM-based school, and what uh, the STEM-based means is that it's project-based, and we focus on science, technology, engineering, and math there. Um, it's an iPad school, it's the only iPad school that we have in the district. It's been that way since 2012. Um, the students and the teachers have been trained that way. Um, they, they really like that, that methodology of using the iPad for um, the, their different courses. It is a different schedule there. It's on a block schedule because of the Career Center, uh, the Franklin County Career and Technology Center, because the Career uh, Center is on a semester about program. So they need to be on a block. And what that block means is that their core subjects like English will be on two periods a day for a semester. The electives then are on a, a single period. So it's a modified block. Uh, some schools do a full block and that's four periods a day, but then their electives are only nine weeks instead of a semester. So that's why we're on a modified there. The Franklin County Career and Technology Center has 372 students and that is for out throughout the whole year. Right now this semester they have 188 students. Uh, the previous semester they had um, 184. <coughs> with that they have 25 different programs there, cooperative education and hands-on learning with skills based and focused on moving out into the workforce. Our secondary programs within the two high schools, advanced placement, 346 students, but 607 total enrollments into courses. So, and I apologize, I did forget to throw in uh, Career Magnet School. They have 151 students taking um, six or seven different courses there. Uh, International Baccalaureate, this is the high school only. They have 17 diploma students with a total enrollment of 286 students taking different courses. Uh, the Navy JROTC program, uh, is 123 students. Our cutoff on that is 100. We need 100 students on October 1st in order to conti continue with the Navy for um, helping us through the funding and things like that. So we're happy to see 123 students. The, the co-op education, internships, all those items that help students uh, in, in their job searches and in their works. Um, we have 72 students right now with uh, one part-time teacher in that. And then in dual enrollment, we've been working very hard getting many partners uh, with uh, the different universities and colleges, and we have over 130 students taking dual enrollment courses this year. Graduation. Um, graduation is very important because it's the pinnacle of what we want the kids to have. Uh, and we produced that policy of 217. Uh, with that policy uh, states that we have these requirements of 23 credits. And you can see on the screen there that each student needs to have four English credits, uh, three and a half social studies, four math, three science, uh, six and a half electives, and you have fitness well. S um, students at the at Cassius. Sure, you could have multiple schedules there. Could but don't. Could but don't, yes. I don't know that we'd have the staffing to run blocks. Adding a period to the day 
and go on to block four by four would require uh, staffing investment. We could, but we'd have to analyze if we're able to do that. Correct. Not with the existing staff based on what we have. I, I'm pretty sure we would not be able to. No, that's correct. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we can't do it in our blueprint. Correct. And secondly, where does the honors program come into your categories that you were talking about, the IB and the advanced placement and the... The, the honors is, um, we don't really, I, I mean, precursor. it's a precursor for the AP and IB. Um, honors program is, uh, and it's, it's really not a program, it's just a level of, of the class that they're taking that's a, a above the regular class. So there's, there's honors, there's a lot of honors at the high school, uh, just about in every core subject. But they're, the, they're the ones that they show um, more growth and, and more academic achievement, so they go into the honors, and then when they look at the honors level, then they, that gives them the opportunity to move into AP and IB, if they would like. They do have quite a few students in the honors level. I have, I have a question. Um, the dual en uh, enrollment, the funding for that, has that come out or was a, there was an issue with that, that the, with that state? I believe we received word um, last Thursday or Friday that we should be expecting it soon. So that was a grant for $75,000 um, and that it's just been on hold. Um, did you hear something about that, Bobby? If I don't, maybe it was Tracy. You did, okay. There we go. Was there a time limit on that? Was there a? Well, it was supposed to be this year. Yeah. Okay. So, I know that what we have done is we, the counselors have spoken with the ch um, the students, and they have already um, um, applied for that. We made an application for them if they wanted to be reimbursed. Um, that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to reimburse right. students. Okay, that's what I was saying. What does that look like? It's correct. It's not going into next. We won't be able to. Is that like grades? Yes. There, well, there's 130 students in it, but they're mul they're doing multiple courses. So right now, um, I I think they have 50 or 55 applications. Um, I I know for sure once the applica or the money starts coming in, there's going to be a lot of kids going down to the yeah. counselor saying, "Hey, I'd like to apply for this." Yeah. But we have criteria that we have to go through first. Right. What is the average number of credits that the dual enrollment student has whenever they graduate? Um, I would say the average is probably 15. The reason um, I ask, I know that at Bloomsburg, uh, they have students graduating with a two-year yes. degree. Yes. And that seems to me to be something we ought to be. It's growing. Uh, it's growing, Mrs. Gulger. I can say that um, when I was principal, uh, we we had maybe three, six, nine credits that they would graduate with. Um, it is growing now that SHIP has the SHIP start for students. Um, they'll go in their junior year um, and do um, all but one or maybe one class at our high schools, and then they'll go their full senior year. So they're, they're coming out with close to, um, you know, uh, the equivalent of the um, associate's degree. Let me jump in there on the Bloomsburg. Um, in my previous employment, we visited Bloomsburg uh, and modeled some of our changes in, in my previous district that I can't say uh, around that idea. But they did focus on college and the high school, which is different than dual enrollment. So their teachers became certified adjunct professors and their regular courses counted as college credit. That made it much more cost effective um, and many more students would get access because dual enrollment, there's barriers to uh, transportation and access. So different model, but very doable uh, in Chambersburg for sure. We have two, um, we have Harrisburg University with yep. the high school and we have uh, Harrisburg Area Community College with the magnet school for English. Um, Harrisburg, Uni uh, Harrisburg University is actually going into the AP courses and uh, the AP courses align with their curriculum, then they will give the students uh, three credits for that course. And just to be clear on that, that model, um, those college and high school course credits are much, much cheaper, but we're also we're paid for as part of the school district budget to about 80%. And we tried to focus on making sure every child could have access, just not families who could afford 
the additional money. So there's a way to move down that path that's very affordable for students and get some college credits. That is a big part of the blueprint of how we uh, have affordability for students while in high school and getting them credits. So CTE is another big part of the blueprint as well as job apprenticeships and job shadowing. So when we start talking about the blueprint in action, you're talking graduation requirements. This is all the exciting stuff. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, but this is the work uh, ahead of us. I think uh, many of you will want to see that work. You might want not want to see the price tag of the work, uh, <laughs> but you'll at least want to see the work and what's possible. Mm -hmm. And then we can see what we can afford. Thank you. And just as we go through the presentations, uh, hopefully you can see the connection between the budget, the academic presentations, and soon uh, enrollment coming up. These are all somewhat connected as part of a feasibility study. So, but we wanted to drive educational programming first. Whatever we do, it's about educational programming and then we wrap facilities around how to deliver that. So just, I keep talking about it, but now we're getting into some of the, the, the meat and potatoes of, of what we possibly can do. I think that kind of goes to the goals that we have, you know, on the, um, <coughs> poster there, academic achievement is number one. Okay. 5.02, of course, if there's any discussion, we'll go to executive session on that one. That's going to be on the agenda. 6.01, Mr. Bigger just teed this up. Enrollment history and projections. So John, are you gonna do introductions? Am I doing introductions? Oh, go ahead. John Badia from Crabtree Rowball is here as the um, kickoff person, I believe. Um, just while he's getting set up, we were looking at a demographic study and after contacting uh, Crabtree and showing them the Pell studies we've had, uh, they said, let's take a stab at maybe saving you some money and we'll take a stab at um, doing a study for you. So. Uh, we've seen this internally, uh, pleasantly surprised with some of these results, and I think you will be as well, uh, to give us some confidence moving forward. So I do want to thank them for reaching out, but also providing the service to us. Sure. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to jump to uh, introductions, a little bit about our roles. I think most of you might be familiar with Jeff from previously working on uh, the projects to address the ESSER funding uh, for the various projects throughout the district. Uh, I've been in the background uh, many years within the district, uh, having worked on some of the other previous projects. And tonight, Dr. Witham, uh, who joined our firm a few years ago, a uh, retired superintendent from Cumberland Valley, who helps us uh, do a pretty deep dive into enrollment, which is the core of a lot of the planning decisions in terms of, of enrollment. And I think what the superintendent asked us to talk about tonight, that many, many parts to the study, we really want to focus on enrollment, but we're going to hit some high-level topics. Um, and really, the, the goal of a comprehensive district-wide study is really to provide the board with the resources to essentially make a defendable decision. It's a very large district, many facilities, lots of moving parts. You've all talked about uh, the financial uh, issues, uh, the program. The study should bring all of those things together in a comprehensive fashion that supports your vision. And so that will be our goal of the study, but we're also here to listen to all the things that you have as a board and the concerns that you have that needs to be addressed as well. Jeff? I can go. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. Um, really, this evening's more focused in, on enrollment, but we want to sort of talk big picture about the overall purpose of the study as well. And I want to mention just a few years ago, we did uh, also did a, an update to the study. But um, this is what we're looking at now is more of a broad, broad uh, breadth approach to the entire district, where the last study was really focused on how could we very efficiently move forward with the ESSER dollars for the district and how could we dis disperse them evenly throughout the district. So it was more uh, really facilities based. Uh, specifically, we focused uh, heavily on the elementary schools. Um, as well as this, as this building. So throughout the study, we're going to be looking a little bit more broad breadth at 
uh, short and long-term uh, planning that, that John mentioned. Uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about projected enrollment, uh, looking at the educational uh, vision of the district. We're also going to be, while we've, we've already looked at how the buildings are being utilized, we're going to be doing updates uh, to the floor plans, how are the buildings being utilized right now. That changes very often, not just yearly, but even throughout the year. So how are your, your facilities being currently used? How are they changing? Uh, and, then, and then trying to plan for the future. And then ultimately creating a decision-making matrix. Um, we did want to mention, uh, typically what we try to do is build the feasibility studies around the Department of Education. The original goal of that was so that you could be eligible for plan con reimbursement. Uh, the moratorium has been a, uh, in place at the, di at the state level for, it's going on eight or ten years now. Uh, we do not see any openings in that right now, but we still want to follow the process. So if there would be an opening, an opportunity, uh, the district could move on that very quickly. But at this time, that, that is not uh, uh, something that's uh, eligible. So these are just some of the requirements. And again, um, I think the discussion was that we're going to be breaking these down into sort of bite-size uh, blocks to present to you. So this evening, we're going to be focusing more on enrollment. Uh, but other components that will be coming to you in the future is uh, looking at capacities, updates to that, as I just mentioned, facilities condition, cost upgrade. That was really a, a large focus of the Essers round projects that we did of uh, really taking your existing facility, not making any modifications of them, and simply upgrading uh, so that everything is up to date in those facilities, whether it's uh, windows, roofing, lighting, things of that nature. What we're now going to be doing is taking that data and, and updating, as I mentioned, but then looking at options of moving beyond just uh, uh, your facilities conditions and upgrading them to current standards, but what are directions that the district could go with your facilities to support your educational model? So that may be changed, not just upgrading your existing fil facilities, but how could you modify the buildings to meet your educational program? That might be changes within your buildings. That may be reconfigurations of grade structures in the buildings. We're going to be having those discussions and then bringing those forward to you uh, as we move in the future. And then with that, we're really moving into the meat of this evening, which is going to focus <coughs> on enrollment, and Fred is going to take over at this Thank point. Thank you. Good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening. Fred Witham. I'm the Director of Educational Planning. I am a 35-year retiree of the public school system. My last six years was in Cumberland Valley, as mentioned. Um, I also taught the facilities course at Chippensburg to aspiring superintendents for over a decade um, after completing my doctoral work in facilities. So that's what really brings me, uh, brings me here tonight. Uh, I want to start out by showing you your 30-year history of enrollment and the trend. I mean, you have been over the past uh, 20 years, 30 years, I'm sorry, on a constant slow climb. You can even see that you know, you hit those times where we had the Great Recession, we've had, you know, prior housing booms. This is going all the way back into the 90s. You could see the COVID dip um, out in the out years in uh, 2021. But you can see that that line of, of uh, the trend line really just kind of plods right along. Um, so you've had a really consistent uh, track record, uh, which shows in your Pell studies, you've done uh, Pell studies now, um, we had four that we were able to review. The most recent one in February of 22 uh, that they completed. The, um, the nice thing about having uh, had that many studies over that much time is now you can begin to look back and see how they did for you. Um, and they did well, um, even when you consider the fact that you had a, you know, the, an unanticipated COVID dip. Um, you can see each of the studies uh, the older ones um, really projected a little bit faster growth. Um, the other ones, uh, the later years, and then particularly, you know, this past year uh, with the COVID dip, um, not quite as much. Uh, but still, you can see they were within 4% uh, on the 2006 study. They were within 1.3% of the 2013 study. They were in 4.22% of the 2017 study, and they're currently within 1.09%. Now, I have to tell you, I think sometimes people think that when you mathematically model these, these enrollment trends, that it's going to give you a definitive number. But 
charting enrollment trends is like trying to figure out what your favorite stock is going to do over the next 10 years. You can get a well-educated guess, but you're never on any given day going to be exactly where you think it might be. You might be a little up, you might be a little down, but their margins of error have been consistent with what you would anticipate for a well-done study. Fred, do you mind on just explaining the lines real quick just so they all yeah. get into those lines? Yeah, honestly. So each line is a different Pell study, and the dark black line is the actual um, enrollment that occurred. And I was looking at the first five years after the study was published, so the first year of projection against that year's actual enrollment, second year against actual enrollment. And we could, again, we could do that out for a full five years for three of the studies, and then the fourth one, we have only been through the first uh, two years of that study. So you can see that they, they are consistently showing you a four-ish, three-ish percent higher projected enrollment than you're actually experiencing. My gut tells me, not my math, but my gut tells me they're overestimating on your housing starts a little bit. It's not that the properties aren't there, but they're not necessarily being built as quickly as they're uh, modeling into the equations, and they're probably also not bringing in as many young people with some of the price ranges and some of the houses that are going mm -hmm. up. Um, PDE um, also provides you an annual study. Um, again, each of the lines is a different study. PDE, you can see it really adjusts a lot more study to study. And again, that's because of their methodology um, and the way that they use their data. All three sets of data that we're going to show you are calculated doing slightly different things. Um, PDE is using live birth rates from the uh, health department five years prior, your actual kindergarten enrollments, and that's how they're setting your kindergarten rates. And then they're looking at your um, your year-to-year -year retention, the number of students you have in first grade going to second, second going to third. But you can see that over those five studies um, that they actually are a little bit closer uh, than the Pell studies. They were you know, just averaging a little under uh, 3% for their enrollment <coughs> projections. Again, I want to say that don't be over excited about 3% versus 4%, because when you consider the margin of error that each study does, calculates, they're well within an equal margin of error for validity for, if you wanted to say, hey, we're gonna use PDE to project enrollment, you're probably pretty good. If you want to use PAL, you're probably pretty good. We also did an, um, an enrollment study of our own. Um, we um, use, again, a slightly different methodology and you can see um, where our study falls, where the purple line, um, that's kind of right in the middle there. Um, PDE is the orange line, obviously it's the blue line, and then the average of the, or the most recent Pell study. And for, for fairness, you have to remember that our study was done using your actual enrollment that you reported to Pennsylvania Department of Education in October. So we're projecting in this current school year forward when you look at Pell, that there, there's in, uh, it was 24, 23 months ago, they were projecting this year as well as next year and all the other five that we're looking at here. So we kind of had a mathematical advantage, but yet again, the bottom line is, they really kept all very, very tight together. There really are no anomalies in these studies that would indicate really that um, the Pell study is not uh, comprehensive or is missing something. As a matter of fact, they, they took a great uh, amount of time to go back and analyze their previous studies in the district um, to come up with an explanation as to where they were um, in relation to the length of time that they've been working with the district. So again, you could use PDEs, you could use ours. I would encourage you to consider PAL is still a valid study. You made a good investment in it. They're very sophisticated. They know the district by now, but any sets of those numbers will help you, will help you plan. And I think the, the story moving forward is you still are projected to have that slow, gradual climb as time goes on. 
The one caveat I will talk about, actually let me just go here because we, we want to talk about what's coming up next is, and some of these things we've already started. Um, we're really at the end of where you are with your enrollment. We'll have some more conversations so that you as a board can hone in on the number of students that you feel comfortable planning for over the next five and 10 years. We also want to look at building capacity. We dropped off floor plans for all of your buildings. Your principals are getting together and they're going to write what's going on in, in every single classroom so that we can recalculate your capacity. Now you would think that capacity wouldn't change. When the building opens, it has X number of classrooms and here we are, you know, five, 10, 20 years later, whatever, and you have the same number of classrooms. But how you use those classrooms differ. You have had um, a two and a half to 3% uh, increase in special education special education students over the last five years. You've had a two and a half to 3% increase in ESL students. So whenever you take a classroom for 25 and appropriately redesignated for artistic support, of those 25 seats, you're gonna remove 17 because you can only put eight of those seats back in the class for the artistic program. And we've seen this over, we just actually finished a study for State College and they were looking at how many rooms they had when the buildings were originally designed for general ed instruction and how many rooms they actually had now. And they were 10, 15 classrooms short over a decade because they had an increased growing popula population of special ed students. We've also, it's kind of hard to see, but we started to map with the support of your district, um, the students. Each dot is a resident where um, a Actually, that's an elementary student would live. Each different color dot is a different school. Um, we can tell now early, based on some of the information we have, you have schools that are way over enrolled. There's no doubt about it. They're above 90%, this is elementary, above 90% of their capacity. And you have other schools that are flirting with 48% capacity usage. So that again, when we start to put that on there, you'll see those patterns and you'll begin to make some, some decisions about what you wanna do next. Your educational program, that's something we want to consider from the get-go, not only the one that you have now, but any changes that you're visioning in the future so that we can reestablish the capacities that you have today and the capacities that you'll have in each building five years from now as you move to fulfilling that vision. Um, faculty, uh, sorry, facility conditions. Uh, Jeff, do you want to mention anything about how, then we have most of that. No, I think, I think we talked about that briefly. Uh, earlier, it just uh, obviously we did a lot of work with that, most notably in the last uh, three three plus years, focused on the Essers. But we're just going to be taking a deep dive back into that, looking a little bit more holistically, and then just seeing what also what has changed in the district in the last few, uh, few years, which then will allow us to also start developing analysis for potential options of direction for the district uh, and, and you as an administration and board. Uh, want to potentially take the district. And you can see from our little Venn diagram there and the analysis of options, all the things that you're talking about tonight, your, your cost benefit, your resources that are available at the top of your educational program and the district goals that you're working on. So you can begin to find that sweet spot of options that sit in the middle that really can balance the, the data from all of those other areas. And you again, as John opened with, uh, make an informed, defendable decision as to how to utilize your facilities over the next decade. Any questions? Questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I, I'd just be curious to know what, you know, th this analysis is done by professionals who have tons of expertise, but what, what are the major factors that could potentially swing <laughs> a district up or down you, you know what and and we're not experts on this front but but one thing I think about is that we've been a ship without a captain for a while mr. Bigger's doing a great job giving leadership to us now we've talked about how we want academic excellence to be a real forte of ours we've talked about how we want to become you know a better district in other fronts too beyond academics whether it's music art athletics if we were doing just an amazing job as a district I would anticipate that we would have more students showing up at our doors because Chambersburg is offering something that's a, a notch abo above what we've experienced 
in recent times. And I get it, we had a pandemic, which is beyond our control too, and, and some other factors. But I just, I just wonder, that's just my thought, but maybe you, ha maybe you have thought a lot more about this, and maybe that's not actually a game changer. Maybe that, at best, only increases your enrollment by 0.5%. I don't know. <laughs> so how do we, as a board, weigh some of those? And I'm sure we have lots of other thoughts. If you went around the table and we thought about, oh, they're, they're building these houses over here, right? It's got to be, they're building these warehouses. You know, we'd ha we have all these thoughts. So how would you advise us to assess all of those potential changes and know which ones we ought to put stock in and which ones we ought to say, eh, that doesn't really matter as much as you think it does. It, you, so you're making the case for a defendable position. It has to factor all of those things. I think as architects, things that have big swing, educational program. Instead of the building dictating how you're scheduling things and, and offering, what is your vision for the program? To us as architects, that means different type of space, uh, space that's going to function for those needs, perhaps more space. From a demographic and enrollment perspective, you'll hear Dr. Witham talk about our, our take on uh, what we think those growth rates are. What is a defendable position for that planning number um, and cost? So all of those things, if you told us we want it all and architects go and devise a plan, we, we could do that. But we know that's not a reality. We're, there's going to be a budget. And part of this process should be prioritizing. You have a very big district, a lot of buildings, a lot of goals and expectations. The purpose of a study is so that you arrive at an agreement, we need to start here. This is where we think as a board, for this dollar value, we can impact the greatest number of students. Mm -hmm. But then you're not done. Again, the, the study is, this is where we need to go next and next and next. And even if you think about a building as the Department of Education uh, drove their reimbursement model around a 20-year reimbursement cycle because of mechanical systems, changes in enrollment and demographics, a district of your size, you will be in a constant cycle of renovation, as many are, because till you start at your first project and you get 12 to 15 buildings into it, you're starting that cycle again. So part of this study is how do you maintain your edu educational excellence? Um, how do you maintain your budget? Um, how do you fill those 90 positions for staff? How do you provide space for that staff, even if you could hire them? And what is that balance? But it is a 10-year look ahead on striking a balance on all of those things. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add anything? No, the only thing that I would add is that um, when you look at any data set in and of itself, like new houses, you really can't get excited. You really have to look at that data set against other things. I would be more concerned here with houses that are already built built probably in the 50s through the 70s that have great bones that are going to come onto the market as your aging population either retires out of them, moves south, or moves on to some kind of care situation. That's where you'll probably see some growth. So you can look at new houses, but you also have to look at existing houses, the, the, the shape of your population demographics, uh, housing sales and then how those things are moving forward. You actually have, as you've consistently increased in population, you really do have fewer students per household mm -hmm. and fewer students per residence than you had a number of years ago. And we'll get into all of that as well. And all that will help you find, I think, a point where you can feel settled to make your decisions moving forward. John or Fred, um, how many school districts are actually seeing flat or increases in enrollment these days? How many do you see? <laughs> Central Pennsylvania is, you know, you talk about the just nationally and in Pennsylvania, the number of school-aged children is declining rapidly. But the, the ones that are left all seem to be moving between Chambersburg and Harrisburg. <laughs> Um, so, you know, right. we've got the fastest growing county right next door to you guys. We've got the fastest right. growing townships here in central Pennsylvania, and we're getting a lot of in, in migration along with the industry that's been coming in. Um, so there are a lot that are shrinking. I tell the one thing that's common, though, that we're also seeing is this big increase in special education yeah. 
and ESL students. Your Title I schools, when I originally looked at the first studies, you had like, I want to say, 7 out of 17, mm -hmm. and now you have 15 out of 17. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a relatively short time. So while, again, your enrollment's not going up by tons, the needs of any average student has gone up greatly. Microphone. Yeah, use your mic. Sorry, so yeah, oh, this particularly the special education growth. Do you see a, a if you turn it on, you gotta move up, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Sorry. My wife doesn't have this problem. She says I talk too loud anyhow, but uh, so yeah, the special education growth. And I know ESL is another area that's growing like bonkers. So do you anticipate a leveling off, a plateauing uh, of that, or is any, anybody's guess on that? There, it's anybody's guess. Uh, there's, at least in the data that we're seeing, there's nothing soon, but I mean, just logically, at some point in time, it has to begin to, to level off. You know, a lot of the increases are really better identification procedures, not necessarily more kids in the population. So we've, we, you know, as we, particularly with autism, so I, th I think is there's got to be a finite percent of the population in any area that are that have special education needs, and we're just reaching closer to that because we're evaluating more kids. Of course, the pandemic right. also hastened testing, and you know that's identifying more kids as well as parents are trying to get their kids caught up. Uh, re I was on a webinar today, and in the state of Pennsylvania, they're pushing 20 percent as a state average, and we're right there close. What was interesting um, was certainly the high needs special ed category is the one growing the most and is the most costly. So, but we are also seeing our regular special ed students, which are more your learning support, which we feel we can do a better job of preventing if we put systems in place prior to them falling behind. So if you have great remediation, what we call emergency systems, that's great, but they cost you a lot. So uh, part of our educational programming on the uh, learning support students, which is the majority of our students, we have to do a better job of preventing them. And that's the reading by third grade, that's the investment in boots on the ground, right into the classrooms. You know, you can say class size. So I agree to a some degree that classes are large, but our primary grades would be the areas you wanna keep small. You can debate the grades over three uh, up through high school a little bit differently, but those are all the blueprint components too. So, but, but we have to do a better job on the prevention end, for sure, because we're, just think of it this way, if we're spending X on a prevention and it works, we're not spending three times the cost on the special education side. And we're stuck seeing the, a lot more special education students that I feel we can curtail, for sure. I have a question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about a tax reassessment here in Franklin County and how that would affect things. Do you think that that situation, if that were actually done, would that change some of these projections because of what could potentially be going on people because you were talking about housing and things like that because it seems I'm, to be a hot topic. I'm sorry for smiling. It's the retired superintendent in me. He knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I will tell you what they would tell you in all the Shippensburg coursework. Typically, a third go up, a third go down, a third stay the same. So as far as the district, you don't you don't wash out. Now I don't know why that would mathematically be true, but. In all the courses, in all the discussions I've been in involved with reassessment, that always seems to be the final answer. It has to be revenue neutral to start with, with a reassessment. If they, if they legislate it that way, yeah. yes. Which is the way that it currently is. If you just go by the increase in the property values, then we get a, a different drive up. But you're right, the way that they currently do it now, it's going to end up about the same. More questions. I'll just uh, make a make a comment and thank gentlemen from Crabtree Roarball. Um, you really set the table. Uh, a lot of great questions. Uh, I've said it from this microphone for three months in a row now. Uh, there's some heavy lifting to be done, and uh, you know, here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, next item is 7.01, and just a little bit of a prelude into this. I mentioned this item in my uh, president's comments about you know how things get put on the agenda or, or process. Uh, Faye, Chris, and I discussed this in, in our Friday call, uh, and there was you know it was brought up by a board member to to take a look at uh, you know how we all go about privilege of the floor, and. Uh, you know, as you look at that policy, and, and I helped refresh my own memory, uh, you know, even in the current policy, some things that maybe I would like, one little thing I would like to see be changed. But that's why that item's on here. Again, if, if everybody, or I shouldn't say everybody, if the majority here decides tonight that it's good as is, this thing goes away. If the majority says, no, we want to look at this policy a little deeper, maybe tweak this, maybe tweak that, then we'll start down that path. But this is, this is what I've been mentioning, um, you know, Chris's vision, uh, my bit vision, Faye's vision is board leadership of, of how we want to process requests, again, in public with the team of 10. So, um, you know, I'll start with my one thing that I'm not really married to this, and I was uh, part of this um, blow up about three years ago. Uh, there's a provision in policy that says, you know, after 30 minutes, the public comment could end. Uh, we did slightly tweak that policy. It wasn't totally to my satisfaction. So if the board elects to move forward with the 903 revision, that's one thing I want to look at, and it's the part that it says, you know, 30 minutes, however, it's up to the president with consent of the board. Well, I don't think, and now being president, I don't want to make that decision. I think that gets reversed, you know. I would like to see that reversed, that after 30 minutes, it becomes a board vote whether to proceed, not the president's decision whether to proceed with public comment. So that's, that's one thing that I, you know, would like to see discussed with policy 903. Uh, the other one is, uh, and, and this is the one I think that came up, was the, uh, the phrase that is read before public comment. Uh, if we want to look at that, I think somehow, some way, we probably need to reference that in policy. Uh, and if we do want to look at that, I think we need to, I would recommend we need to bring legal counsel in again because it was instituted due to some legal matters. And uh, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't sleep at Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> so before we start changing things that might have had some good legal basis, uh, I think it'd be good that we hear from, from legal counsel. So that's, that's a preface. I spoke too long, so I'll open it up to anyone else. Well, I'm the one who asked for this to be discussed, um, full disclosure, because to me, um, and let me just read for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is what's read before. Uh, this is a reminder that public comment is not a forum for personal attacks, antagonistic behavior, or harassment. Please be advised that you're accountable for any legal ramifications and liability that results from statements that misrepresent the truth, defame individuals, or disclose personal information that is not of public concern. If I'm sitting in the audience and I hear the words legal ramifications, liability, I am less likely to make a comment that I think you might disagree with. That's me. And I'm a very opinionated person, and I would still maybe think twice about it. I am a free speech person, right, wrong, or indifferent. I might not like what you say. I might not like the manner in which you say it to me, but I am all for free speech. I think you should be able to say what you want, and if you want to choose the manner that you say it in that might be a little not to my liking, you still have the right to do that. You have the right to free speech. You do not have free – you don't have the right to – uh, not having consequences from that speech, but most of the people that come in here are adults. And so I feel like with that particular statement, I feel like you don't need to be reminded to not be a jerk when you're talking. It is basically what it comes down to, and I'm just speaking very frankly. I feel like we can have respectful communication, and I, I'm, my concern is that when you use legal terms and imply that if you misrepresent the truth or defame individuals or whatever, that maybe we're n allowing 
that terminology to deter some people from actually speaking if there's a controversial issue that they have an opinion on. And that's why I wanted to discuss it. I know that that was probably put in because of things that have gone on or whatever, but if a person comes up and they do any of those things, then they should already know that there's potential for that. Um, me, I have pretty broad shoulders, so if I make a decision that someone doesn't like and they wanna come and stand for their three minutes and call me whatever they wanna call me, that's fine with me because that's just my personality. Other people may not feel comfortable with that and that's fine. I just have a concern because we do have s not a whole lot of public comment and I'm wondering because everybody's cool to comment out here, out here, out here, but nobody wants to come in and comment and is this one of the factors that might be deterring them from actually feeling comfortable enough to have a dissenting opinion or to talk about something that's controversial. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring it up and just have that conversation about not the policy itself, but about that statement that gets read. So that's where I'm coming from. I think the statement was a reactive statement. Um, and at this point, I think we need to be proactive to prevent similar issues that we dealt with in the past. Um, I would be in favor of softening the legalese of the statement, but I think that there is a significant need for a reminder of the protocol, the decorum, whatever you wanna call it, that is appropriate because we have seen, not just in our district, but in other school districts, uh, very inappropriate behavior at school board meetings. Whether that or not is probably um, up for grabs as far as that's concerned, but it seems as though some proactive uh, action is valuable rather than waiting and reacting to another um, situation that we've had in the past here and we've seen on TV in many other districts. Yeah, um, so I've been only on the board for a few months now, but I've been attending meetings for several years now and I don't know that the demeanor or the verbiage of the people presenting changed at all from the time that statement was read. People got up and said what they wanted to say mm -hmm. and I think Stephanie makes a good point. There are other people out there that are less outspoken than some of the people that show up here, for sure. And it may, in fact, discourage them from speaking up. So I don't know how anyone's behavior had changed once that statement was beginning to be read. I didn't see a change at all. The only and thing so I would say is- it's not harmful then if it hasn't changed. It's not harming anything. I think the most important thing would be to say to someone and it's, it's here in black and white, you have three minutes, and then three minutes is up, you cut the mic. Mm -hmm. Consistently. Mm -hmm. Consistently, that, that's more of a limitation than a statement that's gonna discourage people from actually getting up and saying something. Well, and Mike, if I may, I think to Mike's point, what he, what he was trying to say, or, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that he, the statement got implemented and there was nothing before that that he felt warranted that statement, and so there's been nothing after that. So the statement didn't really do anything, so is it hurting more because people aren't commenting, and if there wasn't one specific thing, like if you didn't have someone standing up here yelling, screaming, whatever, you know, so the statement is really unnecessary because it didn't change any behavior. There wasn't behavior before it, there wasn't behavior after it, so are we losing people in the middle who maybe are kind of taken aback with the legalese of it? You know what I'm saying? That's how I, is that what you were, that's how I understood what you were trying to say. That's, that's okay. Fine, yeah. It um, strikes me as unnecessary and overkill, and I see no reason that we couldn't have it on hand if the president, if things get out of hand, the president could remind everybody, but does it need to be shared every time we have public comment? I, I don't think so, personally. Maybe there's a legal reason too, but. Yeah, and I if the solicitor comes back and has this, 
it's not a hill I'm going to die on. I just want to be clear about that. I'm not going to stand here and get into whatever with everybody. And this has to be, that's not my style. Uh, you know, there are hills I'll die on. It's not on, it's not this for, by any means, but it was just something that I had thought about. I remember specifically the first time I heard Mark Sher read it and I thought that's aggressive. That's exactly what I thought. And I didn't even know where it came from, but that's just me sitting there. I thought that that's relatively aggressive. And then as we've gone on, other people have said stuff about it. So it was just something I wanted to have a conversation about and see kind of where everybody else was. I think that, I think we, we um, as elected officials, there are things that we, along the line of Van and what you're saying, you know, I might not like hearing some of the stuff that people have to say or whatever else, but as elected officials, that's part of the job. Um, and to be honest with you, and I, I believe I've mentioned this before, I, for the things that I've seen online at different school board meetings, I think Chambersburg, I think we do very well. I, you know, I, I've <laughs> never le left, the, left the parking lot and felt like I had to look over my shoulder or whatever. And I've seen some, some school board meetings where it looked like, good Lord, what is going on? Um, but with that being said, I, you know, if, if there was a statement of, you know, hey, let's, let's bring back the digni dignity to our statements, because I don't want to tone anybody down who's passionate about this, their children are coming here. We're doing things that are affecting and impacting their kids or the community or what have you. And um, I think sometimes we need to hear that passion without necessarily, you know, squelching it or, or quelling it. Maybe a statement of, hey, let's, let's, uh, uh, keep the dignity to the forefront. You know, we're all human beings. We're all, I mean, uh, uh, something along that lines. But, um, yeah, I don't want to be too heavy-handed with the, with the statements of, you know, legal ramification and so on, so. It sounds a little punitive. Um, it does. Um, maybe a softener. Yeah. Um, because it's setting the tone. If the board conducts itself in a certain way, the members of the community are going to respond appropriately. And we're here for kids, and we need to reflect that in our words and in our deeds. It takes a lot of courage to come up here. Mm -hmm. So, and it takes a lot of courage for us to sit here. <laughs> um, and I think we should act like responsible members of the community and public servants. And our I, I think there needs to be a welcoming, as a matter of fact, in either the resolution or the policy, it says something about the fact that we uh, value the comment period and so on. I forget exactly where I read that, but the I board, think the that- The board recognizes the value to school governance for public comment and educational issues, the importance of involving members of the public I in think, board meetings. I think initially first, making that yes. type of a statement and then a softened version of the current statement mm -hmm. would be a good move. As, as I say, proactive versus reactive mm -hmm. is, I, I don't wanna see us get to a point where we have to react as we did when this statement was added. Mm -hmm. And the only way we are not going to have to react, in my opinion, is by being proactive in having some statement. But I, I think it needs to include a welcoming of public comment mm -hmm. and then a version of expectation that you're going to maintain a decorum mm -hmm. that is appropriate. And perhaps even an explanation of how public comment works if we could, because I know there's a lot of people who specifically when things were going on that aren't good, they get upset because we don't respond to them because they don't understand mm -hmm. that that's not how the public comment works. Well, and uh, I, think, I think Chris's forums are providing that opportunity that we've not had in this community mm -hmm. at any time that I'm aware of in the past on a regular basis. So I think that we're already seeing a change in a very positive direction for communications. And I think that um, the need may be lessened as a result of 
the public forums that we're having. I'd, I'd like to add that I, I think it's a, it would be a good idea to soften it, and I like the idea of you know, starting out in a positive mode, and, and your idea, too, of saying you know, that, that um, we should, with the, what should we just said? <laughs> just <lost> <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, putting, putting that information in there, but, but softening it, but um, the, the, the hardest thing I think is when, when what I've experienced and, and noticed um, even before being on the board is personal attacks. Like you don't want that personal, people coming up here and standing and personally attacked and saying, Mrs. Harbaugh, you're such and da 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 da. And that I've, I've, I've noticed that and heard that. That's the kind of thing you want to stay away from. I don't think as sitting up here we need to have personal attacks coming yeah. coming in. And that can happen. So if you put something in there of, of not maybe using different verbiage mm -hmm. but something that, that avoids personal attacks, we, we don't need that. Sitting. Why don't we just ask people to be respectful and constructive Was with that their something comments? Yeah. Whatever the wording <laughs> is. But is I that something the board president then could, could stop? Well, it's well, very hard. If they, if they, no, I, that's just a genuine yeah. question. That's I mean, a genuine when they're question. going full force, uh, they're landing you. you yeah, know. As, as board president, and that would be a great idea, but if, right, consistency. Right, and, yeah. And if it's not in policy, y you know, yeah, right. you know, then, you know, you're going to stop this party, but you're not going to start stop the next party. Well, because and that consistency. More to say. Yeah, just and have a little bit more. To yeah. Say. Well, consistency yeah. is. Uh, I only have one more thing. I only yeah. have one more thing. Consistency has been an issue because there are times that I've seen people get cut at three minutes, period, and then there are times that people have gotten to talk five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree you know, with and what so Mike I, I agree said. with the. I agree that the consistency mm -hmm. needs to be there, but even just, I think my hope is that because of the new direction and like Ben said, now that we have someone at the at the helm that is. I think we're all heading in a better direction, and I think the relations between the administration and the public and the board and the public are mm -hmm. heading in a better way, mm -hmm. that it, we can soften this mm -hmm. and still have the desired result because now mm -hmm. there might not be as much angst or whatever the feeling is from the public directing that personal attack. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And if somebody comes up and starts into it, well, at that point I would assume I can say, hey, I was wrong and you know, let's revisit this again or whatever the case might be. But I, I really, it's just, it, it just sounds, I just remember so distinctly when Mark read that the first time and I thought, that is aggressive. And, and, and that's what I thought. And I thought if I was a kind of a more shy person, I'd be like, well, I don't know if I wanna say what I wanna say now because what if I think I'm speaking something that's truth because I was told that and it's a misrepresentation because I was repeating, let's say a rumor or whatever, am I going to get in trouble now? You know what I mean? Just asking questions for clarification. So, Mr. McKee? Yes, go ahead. Taking it all in. Okay, yeah, I like <laughs> to take it all in, and I, I would agree that uh, the welcoming is so important. Uh, I think that people feel welcome here, but I would agree with what I've heard from a number of board members that uh, because of the administration we have now, there is a more transparency, a more openness, where people can feel free. And, and I think that also that people understand, you know, how to conduct themselves, you know, in, you know, in, in public when they make public comments. And, uh, you know, I, I have to trust, and it's a, a human nature, <laughs> uh, that they will do that. If they hear a welcoming and just say, uh, we, we speak, you know, you know, whatever. I mean, I, you know, I've been in positions all my life where people disagree with me, mm -hmm. and that's, that's going to be part of life, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And uh, I guess uh, if it's too, too hot in the kitchen, just get out of it, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it may be. So, all but, right. Uh, well, I think uh, what I'm hearing, um, we'll move this forward. Um, um, Chris already has some good ideas. We'll start on, on taking a look at this. Um, <laughs> my, my final comment is, and yes, it has been very mild of late, uh, but uh, I guess Lance got to sit here for it also. But uh, just try sitting here or watching on your screen when you're having a COVID return students to school debate 
<laughs> and you want to get some lively comment, uh, try an athletic program or, or high-profile coaching position, and you'll pack the house, and that will be very intense. And actually, the most recent one, which I think is a low moment, and I'll, I'll preface this by I'm like uh, – uh, like Steph, I'm not married to this either way, but to me, this was a very low moment not too long ago when there was during public comment and we were discussing some of the content in books. And the person decided that it, they wanted to read the paragraph, you know, very specifically. And it's a very graphic paragraph. And I, I politely reminded them that. You know, you are on YouTube, and this is being broadcast, and it didn't phase them a bit. So I don't think it matters what the statement says. If they want to say it, they're going to say it, whether there's a statement or whether there's a real a statement with a lot of teeth in it. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, I, if I'm thinking about the same one, that person probably shouldn't have been allowed to public comment. Oh, yeah, she was a representative of district employees or districts. Uh, it, it says a representative yeah. of a or uh, representing a group in the community or school district. So she, uh, yeah, she fit. It's a big question because they want you to say you can't say it and then therefore you can't have it in school. Yeah. I mean, it's totally an uh, un... It's a know, setup. It, it's uh, something you can't win. It's a lose-lose discussion. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. So, all right, we'll move this forward and continue on it. Um, I don't want to cut it off, but if there are... Does anyone have any other closing comments? Okay. Chief Carter, we didn't get too rowdy, so you don't have to settle us down. <laughs> Save the best for last. Yeah, oh boy. <laughs> I just, before we get started, I do want to thank him for putting this together. I've asked, you know, for constant updates for the public and the board about safety, and sometimes it's hard to open the transparency door and not react, but uh, we're going to tell you what we do and tell you what goes on, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I do appreciate you providing what information you can. This will um, uh, help us that we won't have to have an annual June report where we go into executive session to talk about safety because we're doing it every month. Um, we may still want to do that if we have to talk about some significant issues on strategy for keeping schools safe, but just letting you know this covers our annual requirement. Okay. What? Is this on? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm just going to cover a couple slides very quickly. Um, I have some, some uh, specific topics that we're going to go over, but just Act 44 compliance, uh, safe to say, some equipment training grants and resources, um, reported incidents that we actually handle as a police department as a, and as a uh, district, uh, talk about some emergency drills and some uh, memorandums of understanding. Uh, currently, right now, all of our MOUs, are, um, I should say the majority of our MOUs are up to date. With the police departments, they're up to date, Chambersburg, uh, PSP, Carlisle PSP, Chambersburg Borough, and Franklin County Sheriffs. And our reunification uh, MOUs are, we still have a couple that are outstanding. We've provided them to the reunification uh, points, but we just haven't got the MOUs back. But the majority of those are, are out there and, and taken care of. Um, just a couple of projects right now that are still going on um, within the district, just because of the ESSERs. Uh, that's winding down, but the expansion of radios and repeaters, uh, all of our schools right now have two-way radios that we can communicate. The repeaters are actually up on the schools to allow the radios to communicate with each other. We're still looking at 3M um, ballistic or shatterproof film on doors and windows at every school. Uh, bollards is being discussed, interior and exterior gates, PA systems and intercom systems. Right now, all, all of our schools are in process of getting uh, brand new PA systems and intercoms, which allows us to communicate into an individual classroom or out on the playground and vice versa, but to make an all call throughout the school. Uh, new and upgraded camera systems. So right now, our cameras, uh, Matt Barner and I are working through that. We have cameras in the district that are 15 years old or older. So we're trying to work through um, some new installation of, of cameras and get some upgraded cameras, starting with our secondary schools, moving down to uh, the elementaries. Raptor Visitor Management, we used to have School Gate Guardian. Um, that's just the new program that we have. Um, school pass attendance uh, has taken place in at the high school. 
So that's helping us keep track of some kids as they're going moving through the school at various times of the day. Uh, fob readers and door entry additions uh, systems are very important. We find some schools have doors that don't actually have fob readers or swipes on them so that they can get in and out. With all the drills we're running, safety precautions, we want to make sure that all the entrances that we need to go in and out of actually have easy ease of access. So that's going on. Um, so a lot of different things are going on. One of the things that I was asked to talk about was some safe to say incidents that we handled. I only did uh, currently uh, December through February. Total incidents or safe to say tips we've had in those uh, two and a half months is 37 total. Um, the good thing here is life safety tips, it's only two. And I, don't, I wanna knock on wood because they're the suicide ideations, they're somebody's having struggles in crisis. Uh, we've had a few of those, not very many, fortunately for us. The non-safety tips, um, and I'll go back and say that every safe to say tip that comes in, again, gets vetted, it comes in to me, and I think eight other people are on that, that actual list that see them. And then what I do, either myself or, or Mr. Widman, is we forward it out to the individual school they go to for action on that item that comes in. A lot of times the principals work through those because they're not really criminal in nature. It's more of a, um, you can see bullying and cyberbullying. That's the number one thing that we get called in all the time. 14 of those. So every one of those I send to a principal and those principals work through it and then they have to put a disposition into that safe to say tip uh, for the Attorney General's office. So every tip that comes in gets individually worked and looked at to make sure that we're taking care of our kids because that's what it boils down to. What you're seeing up here though in, in the ones that are listed, uh, dating violence, inappropriate online communication, smoking, tobacco, threat against person, threats against person or school, that is what the person that's inputting the tip categorizes it as. So that may not always be the case for every tip, but when we vet those tips, then we figure out uh, you know, where they need to go. Some of these do turn into incidents that we handle uh, as a police department, but I would say probably 85 to 90% of these are handled by the district administration, which they do a phenomenal job of making sure that we're taking care of those kids and parent contacts and um, you know, peer mediation and things like that uh, between those tips. Does anybody have any questions on safe to say? Gary, why, my mic's getting ready. How many happen outside the school day that we have to do wellness checks on? How many happen during the school day? Just a um, I, I would say probably more happen outside than okay. inside. So explain the difference on response when it's outside versus in. Yeah, so the, the, the difference is, and again, depending on the tip, if it's non-life safety or if it's something that is going to spill over into school the next day, we try and work on those immediately. That might be me reaching out to PSP or CPD to, to do a wel welfare check on a student or if there's a weapon involved we send the police department out to the house to make parent contact and student contact some of those we may not want the student to come in the next day uh, we have some that we actually have had to do search warrants on because of online threats <coughs> TikTok, things like that that are threatening the school so each of those is handled individually um, but i would say probably half of those have been outside of the school day and i got to be honest with you I don't really like the ones that come in at 2 a.m., but some of them do that. Um, but the majority of them come in um, probably between, as soon as school ends, they don't want to report it to an administrator or they don't want to report it to a teacher. So this is a way that they can do it anonymously, which you know we truly appreciate. And we actually tell all of our kids about this program so that they have the ability to report it in a different way. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Uh, first, I uh, appreciate the monthly or frequent update on this kind of stuff. And I think you guys are doing a great job, you and your team, um, seriously. But I'm interested in mostly because I talk to a lot of kids when I have an opportunity to, they talk about bullying. And I guess my question is, is bullying an equal opportunity kind of employer or is there some usual suspects that these are the bullies and they're, they're the same ones over and over and we just can't? I, I wouldn't say that they're the usual subjects. Um, and what I'll say about bullying is bullying is very tough. And the reason I say that is because it's not always reported. You know, we, and, and I've heard people in school board meetings say, hey, bullying is going on, it's going on all the time. What I can tell you from the five years that I've been here is any time it's been made aware to the administrators, like they're looking into it, they're talking about it, they're talking to kids. Specifically, if we have one bully that's doing it in one school, you know, we've talked to them individually We've talked to the victims of the bullying. We've talked to parents of victims. We've talked to parents of the bullies. 
and it goes on throughout the district. But I wouldn't say it's the same people. I would say it, it, it's circumstantial. Schools probably all have what is a bully, right? But the bullies, it's more of a, it, it happens a lot in the elementary schools and the middle schools, but the problem with bullying is a lot of it goes on social media, okay. right? So it spills over into the school from the weekend when they're out. So, you know, anytime it's brought to our attention, a lot of times it's not criminal. It's more of a peer mediation or it's more of, of a parenting issue or it's more of a school knowledge issue. As soon as we know, we're trying to educate kids on bullying. I go into, I've done it in kindergarten, I've done it the whole way up through fifth grade, I've done it in sixth grade at, at full assemblies or individual kids where we talk to them about the ramifications of bullying. Mm. I go into elementary schools and I ask them if they know what bullying is and they tell me what it is. I ask about cyberbullying, they tell me what it is. I ask how many elementary kids, third, fourth, and fifth grade have cell phones, and the majority of those kids in the class raise their hand. So it's across the board, very tough to detect unless somebody comes forward and lets us know, or teachers are pretty good at seeing it and heading it off at the pass. So we do have a lot of teachers do a really good job with that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on that, safe to say? Okay, so just real quickly, uh, in December through February through today's date, uh, our police departments handled approximately 230 total incidents, anything from criminal to administrative to policy violations. We've conducted about 350 school visits and checks, safety checks. Um, some trainings that we have done just, again, December through February, we have our annual uh, police officer MOPEC, MOPEC virtual trainings, legal updates, which, which are mandated uh, for school police officers. I've attended some grant webinars. Uh, I also attend a quarterly regional threat assessment training, which is put on by the FBI, um, because regional threat assessment teams, county threat assessment teams, and individual school teams are now a very big deal and have come to the forefront because of Act 18. Um, school pass training, which was instituted at the high school. Um, police department canine training. So what we did at the Chambersburg High School, and I forget what the date was, I think it was the 28th of December, is the Chambersburg Police Department asked us to uh, train with their canines and several other canines in the area within our schools. So we opened the school up and allowed them to do that, um, you know, which truly benefits us because they do come into our schools, not frequently, but they do come in and they do canine searches for narcotics in the schools. Upcoming on the 16th, we have a Stop the Bleed training, which is gonna be put on for the majority of the CASH's um, um, administration and teachers. And then I'm putting on two safety presentations for Marion Elementary teachers and Andrew Buchanan, where we're gonna do some smaller tabletop things, excuse me, for their school. All right, types of incidents we've handled. Possession of weapons, um, 911 calls, terroristic threats, vaping and tobacco fights, possession of controlled substances, marijuana, THC, vapes, and gummies. Institutional vandalism, that's where they damage uh, kind of a school. Um, Entity, a lot of times it's a bathroom issue where they're damaging toilets or, or things like that. Uh, harassment or general calls. Uh, we've had 32 disorderly conduct um, investigations in the last two and a half months. Five simple assaults, 20 vaping incidents, six possession of weapons. Just within the past couple of weeks, we've had some issues with kids bringing in some um, weapons that are replicas uh, that aren't the real thing. But we look into it and we treat them all the same. Um, just because of the, uh, the, uh, the fear factor and, and the, the threats that, that come along with that. Uh, we've had some institutional vandalisms, three, harassment, eight. So just to give you a kind of a capitulation of, of what we've had the last two months, two and a half months in the schools. Anybody have any questions about the types of incidents we have? We're, we're a full-fledged police department. We handle any incident that comes our way uh, if it happens jurisdictionally on our school grounds. They're increased a little bit this year, um, you know. And again, it's it's very it's very reactive. You know, it, it depends on you know what we have and what's brought to our attention. We try and be as proactive as we can, uh, but a lot of what's brought to us is is after it's already occurred. A lot of that occurred in high school. Well, when I first started, I would say yes, and to say a lot, um, you know, if you look at the total incidents we have, we have a lot of incidents, but criminal incidents we don't have as many. Uh, as you would think, but it is certainly trickling down into our elementary schools. Now we have some elementary schools that vape. 
We have some elementary kids that bring in weapons unknowingly um, or knowingly. Um, so it, it, it's literally across the board. Middle school is not so much. Um, but yeah, it's unfortunately across all schools right now. Okay, child line uh, referrals. So this is a big one for us. Year to date, and I did everything from the beginning of the year, was 198 total. Um, Denise Fike actually keeps these numbers for us. So you can see each in individual school. Um, child line referrals, we get probably two to three a day. And that can be anything from truancy, that could be somebody reporting um, a domestic incident that happened at home, child abuse, sexual abuse. So it, we kind of run the, the gauntlet with these as far as um, you know the kiddos and, and what comes out. But these are actually, it's information based, which is brought to a teacher, which is brought to a counselor, which is brought to a principal or a mandated reporter. And then, you know, this goes in. So it's about two a month or two, two to three a day is what we're handling. And they come in uh, at all times a day, um, you know, that, that we deal with normally. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, just wanted to cover drills real quick. So in December and February, so December and now in February, we do our run, hide, fight, active intruder drills. We're supposed to do one of those a quarter. Every month we do fire drills or evacuation drills. Um, and then in January, we did a shelter in place drill. So we drill a lot in the district. And again, it's all about preparedness, making sure that uh, our kids and staff know what to do should there be an incident that, uh, that happens. All of our schools are required to do these drills. They actually report the drills in our Raptor emergency management platform. And to my knowledge, we are 100% um, have done, all the schools have done every one of those drills. So we mandated that. Are, th are those requirements uh, at the state level or is that something uh, so that the school out district of, policy? They're out of Act 44. So they're actually mandated by the state. Okay. I'm, I'm always fascinated by fire drills. You know, we even had a kid nationwide. I don't think a kid has died in a school fire since the 60s yeah. and we still, <laughs> We still do these. <laughs> I mean, the, the buildings, most of them are made out of brick and concrete. So if you have a fire, it's going to be very isolated. Yeah. So wh <laughs> what we try and do with our drills is, you know, we've had the, the principals now kind of, um, I don't want to say up the ante a little bit, but we might shut off an area in a building where normally they would go out and do the same thing every time we're building habits. So we might have them just close off a hallway so that they have to think a little bit so that if something does happen, they can maneuver around. But I, I agree, um, but they are definitely mandated it's, by the state. It's a lot of instructional time, but that's for the state to change. We've been saying that for 10 years. Thank you for affirming what we think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, so that's all I have. Um, just again, a real quick update. Just wanted to cover a few things. Um, certainly open to uh, any questions that you would have or any concerns. Um, you know, as I've offered before, and, and I know Lance has taken me up on that, he may never do again, ride-alongs, walk-alongs, whatever <laughs> you want to do to see what the schools are. Yeah. And, and I don't blame you for the busyness of that day, but I'm sure thinking it was your fault. We should, we should so. have had, we should have had a, a movie camera with us that day. That was, that was something yeah, else. Couple, yeah, a couple real live fire, yeah. fire drills. And, and we have had a, in the last two years, we have had a lot of kids that actually are pulling fire alarms. We have kids intentionally blowing vape smoke into, into the fire alarm so you know it, it is a it's a needed um issue for us you know we actually had a kid call 911 intentionally the other day to try and drum up a response yeah. so we have a lot going on you know with our kiddos so yeah. so and threat assessment management team so we do so right now the psp um so the threat assessment regional um it, regions are just taking effect the fpi is running it right now psp runs our uh threat assessment management team which uh multiple school districts come to they th we used to have a monthly meeting um you know that it is ongoing um so we do have a school-based team uh which is kind of growing and we're trying to expand that a little bit and as a matter of fact we have our um county team and hopefully the fbi coming in possibly in march to train our entire district team so yeah, we work well with them. Yeah, I was aware, but not, not the beginnings of it. I didn't know it was full fledged on like that. But yeah, yeah. I only asked because we're in our school together, but the whole training environment. I didn't realize that's a county wide team. So I 
So they do, and it's it's school based law enforcement. Um, you know, MHMR in in Franklin County. So there's a lot of different people on it, and I know they're always looking for um, certainly other participants. It, it's not really community based um, what they have going on right now. But if it's something you guys are interested in, I can certainly get you included in those emails if you want to attend. For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you for all, all right. you do. I uh, got a chance you. to see what, uh, what your officers and you guys do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, item 9.01. Uh, this is a reminder that public comment is not a forum for personal attacks, antagonistic behavior, or harassment. Please be advised that you are accountable for any legal ramifications and liability that results from statements that misrepresent the truth, defame individuals, or disclose personal information that is not of public concern. Uh, we have two people who have signed in tonight. Uh, Valerie Jordan is first. Item 3.01. The superintendent already got my comment, so I'm going to direct my comments to the school board. I want you to think hard on what I'm about to say because numbers are indeed facts. And numbers that I cite come straight out of the 2023-2024 budget. For this calendar year, the district's annual estimated revenue stream is $193,706,184. The district's annual debt service is 10 mil 10 mil I'll say 10 million 10 and a half million dollars and that's on page 17 and the revenue streams on page 5 I ask you to get away from the idea of debt being such a burden because the district's debt is fully covered by 98% of the taxpayers here and I think that was mentioned tonight by Tammy Stopper the district's annual debt service is approximately 120th of the district's annual revenues too, a very small, very small in comparison to the district's revenues. I wrote a check to the school district for $4,000 based on the entire 2023-2024 school budget of $224,600,000. My check also included, this is a good one, $39.18 going to the $2.2 million deficit created by the former school board. Yesterday in email, I asked Superintendent Bigger to rid us all of the former board's deficit spending. Why? Because the district tops, top rate, rate payer here is Meadowhaven. When this corporation receives a deficit from a school board, the corporation passes the deficit down to the senior citizens living there. Translation, it raises its rates on its seniors living there. Thank you. Now, I have the list of top rate payers, and I also got the county top rate payers. Now, I don't know if I sent that to you yet. I did send it out to other people, so here we go. I'm not anywhere near this list, and none of you are. So, and I'll take everything down to the last penny. The children need what the children need. If they need a few classrooms, and it cost me $8 out of that school year, because 10 million, do it. It's eight. I figure we all go out to dinner, and uh, that's one dinner. And then a number of you go to church and you tithe. How much is that coming out of your pocket? My husband didn't want me to mention this, but my biggest look, my biggest, All right, Mrs. Jordan, wrap it my, up, please. my biggest lift is my credit cards. Thank it's, you. It's not school debt or county debt or local Thank debt. You, Mrs. Thank you, Stephanie. I will Thank put you, something. Mrs. I next will put. Item, next one is Mr. John Jordan. Uh, did
didn't have any addendum item listed, but you're up first. Okay, that's fine. That that happens frequently. Yep. No, no. Okay, no worries. That's fine. That's fine. No worries. Okay, item agenda back to you. Type 10.01, Mr. Baker. So uh, we had a snow day today. We've had, we owe three days if we're on traditional makeup. So if you remember last month, um, if we had a series of snow days, we would consider having school the week of June 3rd. We're currently at three with a little bit of winter left in us as uh, Pennsylvania always has a, seems to have a late March or an early April mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my question to you, just some feedback is, are we leaning towards school or using the days for professional development and other options and and we've been brainstorming what we can do with these three days at the end of the year um, and there are lots of options for us but we don't want to go too far down the planning if we're gonna have school so just give me your thoughts on whether we should have three days of school or three days of training and professional development and I'm leaning more towards the training and professional development only because of a lot of uh, uh, art um, not arguing but everybody's buying for time mm -hmm. so it would really help us to have that time that's mm -hmm. my preference right now but if we have another snow day that's four days. Let's get the kids in for a week and, you know, educate them, feed them, and, and transport them. So that's where I am, but I just wanted to get some feedback from you. I'd like to say that I think it would be great to have some professional development time for the teachers. Okay. I think that it, they, they, it's stretched too thin as far as the availability that we mm -hmm. have to do staff development. So okay. I, would, I, I lean in that direction, especially since it's at the end of the year, yeah. especially. I, I will lead in that direction as well. <coughs> I, do, so do I. I do have a question because it was asked a week ago. Does today's snow day affect any form of graduation? No. Okay. No. Graduation. So would any more snow days affect that? No. no I, don't, I mean, we'd have to have a blizzard of a week or something for graduation to even be considered. <laughs> I know we've had them in the it's 90s. I get it. Um, but no, we don't <laughs> see anything changing that. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Oh, um, one more comment. Um, Mrs. Lang did create uh, from the calendar a parent-friendly calendar. That's so great. if you look at the one side, it's our traditional, which has all the yes, this is uh, wonderful. charts at the bottom. And we did create a family-friendly one. We're vetting it right now to make sure it's uh, aligned with everything. But we'll get that out once we um, have it vetted internally. So that's what a, a little more parent-friendly calendar would look like. Yeah, very nice. Mr. Bigger, can I bring up something yeah. for uh, Read Across America? It's up to the president. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the the Rotarians. Say, say again. No, no. Yeah, I'll do it in under two minutes. Uh, the Rotary is donating uh, books for all of our kindergartners every year. They we uh, a lot of Rotarians come in and they then read the books to the kindergartners. Um, we generally need some extra help. And uh, this coming Thursday, I'm going to try to get as many Rotarians to sign up as possible, but we have open slots. A couple of you already emailed me. So after I give the Rotarians the first go at it, if we have open slots next board meeting, I'll bring the sign up here. And uh, if anyone's interested in reading through our kindergartners, it's a lot of fun. Um, with that is the week of, it's like March 4th. So uh, the first week where you can pick a day that, that works for you, I would have the principal contact you to, to work it out. So, but probably we'll need a couple folks to help volunteer to fill in those spots. Can you add me to the list too, please? The for the list read, I could read. Okay. okay. We'll do a sign up in the weekly report this week, maybe keep a reminder and I click in a link. And I'd also like to say that I've attended one of the kindness tunnels and I know there's been two other board members that have and it is such a neat, neat, wonderful morning. Yep. And I know that others of you are planning too. <laughs> and I thank you. This morning. Yeah. All right. So, so what's we're adjourned.